On April 12, 1861, the United States Civil War began when Confederate forces began a bombardment of the Union-held Fort Sumter at the mouth of the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina. The battle itself was not a great battle, and the number of casualties was shockingly small. But what it began totally changed the lives of millions of people and the course of history in the United States. Learn more about the Battle of Fort Sumter and the start of the American Civil War on this episode of Everything Everywhere Daily. Did I hear you're shopping for a car? Because I've been at it for ages. Ugh, such a time suck, right? Not really. I bought it on Carvana. Super convenient. Oh, then comes all the financing, research. Am I right? Well, you can, but I got pre-qualified for a Carvana auto loan in like two minutes. Yeah, but then all the number crunching and terms, right? Nope. I saw real numbers as I shopped, found my dream car, and got it in a couple of days. Wait, like you already have it? Yep. Oh. Go to Carvana.com to finance your car the convenient way. This episode is sponsored by ButcherBox. Doing a daily podcast means spending a lot of time sitting at my computer researching and recording. To be honest, there have been days that I've been unable to leave the house to go get something to eat. Or if I do remember, it's often too late and everything is closed. This is just another reason why I love ButcherBox. They send frozen, high-quality meats and seafoods directly to my door. So I always have something that I can make in my freezer. Whether it's my famous scotch eggs, a meatloaf, or just cooking up a steak in my cast iron frying pan, ButcherBox's home delivery makes it easy. With ButcherBox, I don't have to sacrifice quality for convenience. If you leave a busy life and are looking for good food for your family with the ease of home delivery, then you have to try ButcherBox. Sign up for ButcherBox today by going to butcherbox.com daily and use code daily at checkout to get $30 off your first box. Again, that's butcherbox.com slash daily and use code daily. The Battle of Fort Sumter didn't occur in a vacuum. There was a reason why it occurred when it did and where it did. The first thing to understand is the events that took place during the lead up to the battle. The election of 1860, which I've covered in a previous episode, was the most important election in American history. The fate of the country literally depended on the result of the election. Tensions between the North and South had been escalating for years, and many people, especially in the South, thought that the election was the last chance to try to stay in the Union. When Abraham Lincoln won the election handily over the Southern candidate John Breckinridge, Southern states felt that now was the time to leave. Just six weeks after the election, and three months before Lincoln's inauguration, South Carolina took the first step. On December 20th, 1860, the South Carolina legislature passed a resolution announcing its secession from the United States. South Carolina was the most pro-slavery of the southern states, and it had been so since the Revolution, so it was no surprise that they were the first to leave the Union. Once South Carolina seceded, the dam burst. By February 1st, seven states had declared their secession, and on February 8th, they formed the Confederate States of America. As with any divorce, dividing up the assets was difficult. In particular, there were military forts that the Union Army still occupied. After secession, the southern states seized most of the federal buildings and military fortifications located in their states. However, they weren't able to seize all of them. Charleston, South Carolina was perhaps the most important port in the Confederacy, making the control of it vital to both the South and the North. The Port of Charleston was one of the busiest and most important ports in the South before the Civil War. It was a hub for the export of cotton, rice, and other goods, which were crucial for the Southern economy. If war were to break out with the North, the port would become even more important for the Confederacy's efforts to trade with European nations, particularly for obtaining arms, ammunition, and other supplies. However, there was a problem. There were two Union-occupied forts that controlled the mouth of the Charleston Harbor. One fort was Fort Moultrie, which was located on a peninsula jutting into the harbor connected to the mainland. The other was Fort Sumter, which was located on an island in the mouth of the harbor. Fort Sumter was part of a series of coastal fortifications built by the United States following the War of 1812. 
The war had exposed the vulnerability of the U.S. coastline to foreign attacks, prompting the government to construct a network of forts to protect important harbors. Fort Sumter, located on an artificial island in Charleston Harbor, South Carolina, was designed to guard the entrance of the harbor. In fact, it was designed to be an impregnable fortress. Construction of the fort began in 1829, but progress was slow due to issues with funding and the challenge of building on an artificial island. By 1860, Fort Sumter was still not fully completed, although it was structurally sound enough to be used as a military installation. The commander of the Union forces in Charleston at the end of 1860 was Major Robert Anderson. On December 26th, just days after South Carolina announced its departure from the Union, Major Anderson decided to move his troops from the less defensible Fort Moultrie to Fort Sumter. Anderson's move was a strategic attempt to secure a more defensible position in the face of growing tensions. Upon leaving, he spiked all the guns to render them unusable and burned all the carriages in the fort. Anderson was appointed as the commander that fall because it was felt that he could better handle what was coming than the previous commander who was near retirement. Anderson's instinct to abandon Fort Moultrie and move to Fort Sumter was correct. The South Carolinians felt that they would inevitably end up taking over the fort, and as soon as the Union forces left Fort Moultrie, they took over all of the abandoned forts along the Charleston Harbor. On December 30th, the South Carolinians took over the Union arsenal, which led to the seizure of 22,000 weapons. They began sending ships to observe troop movements in the fort and threatened to bombard the fort once they had set up the guns taken from the former Union fortifications in the city. In early January, President James Buchanan, who was still the president until Lincoln's inauguration in March, sent a supply ship to Fort Sumter. The ship, named the Star of the West, was a civilian merchant ship, not a military vessel. However, as the ship entered the harbor on January 9th, several shore batteries fired upon the ship, forcing it to retreat. For the next several months, the Union troops at Fort Sumter were in a standoff with the South Carolina militia, which surrounded them. Conditions in the fort were difficult. Fort Sumter's garrison only had 85 men, and they were vastly outnumbered. Food had to be rationed, and the soldiers were put to work on finishing the fort's defenses, which had yet to be totally completed. On March 1st, the command of the siege was given to Brigadier General P.G.T. Beauregard. Beauregard was the first general to be appointed by the Confederate President Jefferson Davis and he was appointed to the rank of general for the specific purpose of commanding the siege of Fort Sumter. Beauregard repeated the demands to Major Anderson that he surrender or abandon the fort, and also began increasing the training of militia units in the city so that they could operate the newly found guns. In an odd twist of fate, Major Anderson was General Beauregard's artillery instructor at the West Point Military Academy. On March 4th, Abraham Lincoln was finally inaugurated as president. One of the first things he was told after becoming president was that Fort Sumter only had six weeks left worth of supplies. The fort ended up becoming a bargaining chip in the first weeks of the Lincoln administration. Virginia had initially voted against secession, and Lincoln offered to turn over the fort if Virginia would stay in the Union. As he said, quote, a state for a fort is no bad business. By early April, things were getting dire inside the fort. Lincoln proposed another supply mission, but this time he would bring in military support. If the merchant ship were prevented from landing, then the army would come in to deliver the supplies and to land more troops. On April 6th, Lincoln sent notice to South Carolina Governor Francis Wilkinson Pickens that the supply mission would take place and that he should not interfere. The notice of the supply mission accelerated everything. General Beauregard issued a final ultimatum for the surrender of the fort. When Anderson didn't agree to Beauregard's terms, the die was cast. At 4.30 a.m., Friday, April 12, 1861, the Southern forces opened fire on Fort Sumter. While the Union forces were vastly outnumbered and outgunned, they did manage to fire a few shots in return. The Union officer who supposedly fired the first shots was Captain Abner Doubleday the same man who, according to legend, invented the game of baseball. The Confederates had 19 coastal batteries that were firing on the fort. They managed to fire 3,000 rounds over a span of 34 hours. 
By the next day, April 13th, the five-foot-thick walls of the fort had been breached, the Union forces were out of ammunition, and fires were starting to break out. Major Anderson eventually accepted the inevitable and surrendered to General Beauregard at 2 p.m. Shockingly enough, despite 3,000 rounds and 34 hours of shelling, nobody was killed in the entire battle. However, two men died on April 14th when the fort fired an artillery salute during the formal surrender ceremony. After the surrender of the fort, the Confederacy took control and began making repairs and finishing the construction that the Union never completed. When news of the fall of Fort Sumter spread, it mobilized both the North and the South. Now that war was finally here, President Lincoln called for 75,000 troops to be mobilized. There was so much interest in the North that the 75,000 quota was met almost immediately. In response to Lincoln raising troops, four more states announced that they were seceding and joining the Confederacy. Charleston became the most heavily fortified harbor in the Confederacy and was a major obstacle to the Union's Operation Anaconda, which was their plan to place a sea blockade on the entire South. From 1863 to 1865, Union forces launched several attempts to recapture Fort Sumter. The most notable of these was the bombardment campaign that began in August of 1863. The Union assault on Fort Sumter began on August 17th, when Union artillery positioned on Morris Island, just outside the harbor, and ironclad warships in Charleston Harbor commenced a heavy bombardment. The goal was to reduce the fort to rubble, making it indefensible. Over the following days and months, Fort Sumter was subject to one of the most intensive bombardments of the Civil War. The Union forces, under the command of General Quincy A. Gilmore, used rifled cannons which were more accurate and powerful than earlier artillery. The bombardment continued sporadically for over a year, with particularly heavy shelling occurring in August and September of 1863. By the end of September, the once formidable fort was reduced to a pile of rubble. But despite this, the Confederate defenders, commanded by Colonel Alfred Rett and later Major Stephen Elliott Jr., managed to hold what was left of the fort. They constructed makeshift defenses within the ruins, turning it into a symbol of Confederate resilience. Despite the Confederate success in keeping the fort out of Union hands, it may have actually backfired in the long run. Because the Union couldn't take the fort by sea, they resorted to taking it by land. After General William Tecumseh Sherman had completed his march to the sea, he moved north and marched to Charleston. On February 17, 1865, the city was evacuated and occupied by Union troops. On the day after the city was occupied, the Union once again took Fort Sumter. After the war, Fort Sumter remained a military fort, but its strategic importance had diminished. It remained occupied until the early 20th century when it became a historical site. In 1948, it was designated as a national monument to be managed by the National Park Service. In previous episodes, I made the distinction between important battles and great battles, which are not always or even usually the same thing. The Battle of Fort Sumter was not a great battle insofar as there were zero casualties and the fight was entirely lopsided. No great military tactics or strategies were on display. However, it was an extremely important battle, insofar as it was the spark that ignited the American Civil War. The executive producer of Everything Everywhere Daily is Charles Daniel. The associate producers are Benji Long and Cameron Kiever. I want to give a big shout out to everyone who supports the show over on Patreon, including the show's producers. Your support helps me put out a show every single day. And also, Patreon is currently the only place where Everything Everywhere daily merchandise is available to the top tier of supporters. If you'd like to talk to other listeners of the show and members of the Completionist Club, you can join the Everything Everywhere daily Facebook group or Discord server. Links to everything are in the show notes. <laughs>